Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this webinar on the value of part time work for disability employment service participants. My name is Helen Dickinson, and I'm Professor of Public Service Research and co director of the Public Service Research Group at UNSW Canberra. Um, and I'm going to chair today's session. Uh, so what we're going to do today is launch a piece of work that was initiated and funded by Wise Employment. Um, and what we wanted to do is explore the value of part time work for people with disability. Um, and we undertook it as, as a partnership between UNSW Canberra, the University of Melbourne and Monash University. So today we'll give you a bit of a, an idea around the background, the research, uh, what we found, what we think this means in terms of um, current uh, employment service systems for people with disability. And we're also delighted to be joined by Bella White, who's going to tell us about her experience of, of working on a part time basis as a, as a young disabled person. Um, live captioning is available today for this session, and you can get to that by clicking the co uh, closed caption option menu at the bottom of your screen. Um, and you should be able to uh, resize that and relocate the captions in your Zoom settings as well. If you want to ask any questions as we go to, through today's event, please type them into the chat function um, and we'll try and answer them uh, as we go through the presentation. As we start today's session, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that we all uh, join from today. I'm on the unceded sovereign land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, uh, and they're the traditional owners and custodians of the land and waterways where I live. I recognize the strength, resilience, and capacity of Aboriginal people on this land, and would also like to extend this acknowledgement to any other Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who join us today. So I'll quickly give us a little bit of, of background um, uh, to the research work that, that we did. Um, we know that there's significant amount of evidence that work's important for people with and without disability. Um, and work can have really important impacts uh, for individuals in terms of health, well-being, um, social, economic and, and financial inclusion. And, and I guess we go a bit further than this and suggest that work can be even more important for people with disability, given uh, what we know in terms of the evidence around people with disability often being in lower socioeconomic groups and more likely to be socially isolated. But when we look at levels of employment for people with disability, we see that they're significantly lower than people um, without disability. So in Australia, about 54% of people with disability are employed, but that's compared with 84% of the wider population. And when we look at this historically, it hasn't really improved substantially. So um, over the last 10 years, employment of people with disabilities decreased about 3%, while for the rest of the population, it's up by 23%. So we've got this real issue here around employment. Um, and given the importance of work for people with disability, we see quite large amounts of um, resources invested by federal and, and state and territory governments into um, this area. But often the focus there is on full-time work. Um, and when we look at um, people with disability in the labor force, we find about double the number of people with disability work part-time compared to those without disability. Um, so some of that will be people with disability who are working part-time who are underemployed. Um, uh, but it's also possible that, that a significant proportion of those individuals engage in part-time work as it better suits their capabilities and, and needs. So the evidence tells us that where people with disability are underemployed, it, it results in worse mental health outcomes. Um, but we don't know much about the benefits of part-time work and how those benefits compare with those um, of, of full-time work. So given people with disability are more likely to be in part-time employment, we thought it was really important to investigate the potential benefits of part-time work for people with disability um, and the broader implications of this in terms of government costs. So in this research, we wanted to explore what the economic impact is on broader government services um, where DES participants work uh, part-time, so for under 30 hours um, a week. So we wanted to understand what the economic and broader benefits of, of part-time employment are, 
um, what the experience of disability employment service participants is through part-time work, and whether there are any broader benefits for um, family members and, and carers. Um, we took a mixed method approach to the research, and we'll um, describe this a bit more um, as we go along. But broadly, what we did was, in the first instance, we spoke to DES participants and consultants um, to understand their views around part-time work and the impacts of that. And then we drew on a number of data um, sets to see whether we could see the sorts of patterns we found in um, the qualitative research played out um, through the quantitative research and whether we could quantify some of those impacts. Now, you're only going to hear from three members of the research team uh, here today, but the team behind this piece of work is, is much bigger. So um, I'd like to acknowledge the work of Aviva Beecher-Kelk, Corinna Saxby, Lou Yi and Anne Kavanagh for the really important roles that they played in supporting this research uh, and making sure that it, that it happened. Now, the work was initiated and supported by Wise Employment. So I'm now going to invite Ari Laufer, who's the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of Wise, to um, say a little bit about why they wanted to initiate and pursue uh, this work. So Ari, over to you. Thank you, Helen. Um, and thank you. I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we work and live on at the moment, and myself also on Warundry land and acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Um, this is a critical question. Why did Wise Employment initiate and fund the research? Um, I, I just feel like, you know, this is probably the question that we're all asking really at this particular point in time, bar the response, but next slide, please. Um, first of all, who is Wise Employment? Um, we, I'm not going to repeat what's on the slide there, but Wise is a customer centric organization it's been around for over three decades, and we do focus on the most you know, appropriate solution for each of our 60,000 clients each year. Importantly, um, we need to put the customer at the centre of everything we do. Um, and you know, for our 60,000 customers, you know, we put them into jobs about one out of every 10 minutes, and that's quite an amazing result. Um, but through our very, very diverse team and our very dedicated team, and a big shout out also to, to Anthony and Monica, who worked incredibly hard in Manaza on this project, um, we, we have a very diverse team, and that does really reflect our customer base. Um, so we work hard on a daily basis, and there's lots of information, a lot of data, a lot of evidence that comes through, both qualitative and quantitative, um, every day. And this diversity allowed us to think a little bit more our data collection process and what our customers have been telling us around part-time employment, around health, around wellbeing. Um, we, you know, we took notice of, we looked into and, and moved on from there. Next slide, please. The Wise Impact Promise um, is, a, is a socioeconomic uh, report framework that Wise has developed. Um, in conjunction with Social Ventures Australia and based on an MIT framework. Um, this does look at the wider impact um, of our customers and our staff about doing no harm in the community, but the impact that we have in the wider community indeed. Um, this data is very extensively, uh, has a lot of rigor around it. Um, it's collected annually on a different basis, sometimes six monthly. Um, and we use a number of sort of well-known formulas and research around that. For example, Oaken's Law, which the government has been using for, for much time, as well as academics around economic um, activity and the Australian Unity Wellbeing Index, which has been around for a long time too, to, to measure personal well-beings. And this has provided us um, with extensive insights and highlights over, the, over a number of years now. And what was really starting to, to show for us was the impact of part-time work. Um, and what does that mean? And also the impact of part-time work around health, well-being, and particularly showing through that those index questions. Um, but the emphasis around part-time work, and you know, even those who are on part-time benchmarks under 30 hours, you know, we would consider that 30 hours to be the full-time equivalent for their benchmark. So you know, we we wanted to look at that, um, and you know, the leading questions that came out of some of this work, and we, you know, pondered this both at an executive level with our operations team and our research team is, you know, what really has been the socioeconomic benefit of part-time work beyond 
the savings in welfare and higher taxation for the government. Um, you know, does part-time work provide a pathway and destination for people um, who have disabilities? And this is a question that we really, you know, were looking and we sort of was wondering how, what is the bigger impact on that? Um, what is the indirect impact on the funding mechanism for those who, who see part-time employment um, as a journey and a destination? Um, and then the more we started digging around this, this was the, the really important one for us, was that there was very limited quantitative or qualitative evidence, data, research around the impact of part-time employment, bar the welfare savings and the taxation component of this. Next slide, please. So, you know, um, our board quite, um, quite kindly um, took the submission, took the ideas from management and, and we initiated and funded the research. And that's where the team that we have today um, came about. And a big thank you also to, to Helen and the Melbourne Uni team, the Monash Uni team um, and the wider researchers at UNSW for collaborating with us, um, you know, a not-for-profit. Um, but we did realise very early that we had to narrow the scope um, and particularly for a 14 month project, you know, we had to really look at that and say, OK, you know, we can't do everything. We can't look at the justice system, the social system, the education system, but we can narrow this down to health and mental health services. Um, so this was an important first step for us to narrow down you know, one aspect. And this does allow us to look at further impact across the other systems over the, over the coming years. Um, so once we got going, you know, we felt that, you know, valuing and, and mining the federal government database was incredibly complex data. And, and for us, this sort of widened up the research component for us. Obviously, we had our own data, we had our impact promises, our, our um, wise insights data, but it was very important for us to mine the wider uh, federal government. And then on top of all of that, then we had the qualitative evidence that, you know, we really wanted to talk to our frontline teams, we really wanted to talk um, to our customers and, and get that evidence as well. Um, what was really important for us as well as we, we developed this more and more um, and the funding component around it was that, you know, part-time employment was a beneficial journey. You know, the, the stamina or the ecosystem around to getting to full-time employment, but was quite clear to us and to look further around that it's not just a destination. Sometimes part-time employment is the destination um, and the benefits to the wider community. And that wider community is the cost savings. And you know, how do we quantify you know, the bridge into improved social inclusion, health and well-being, increased independence, financial stability? And um, I think the, the team have done a fantastic job in, in clarifying all of those aspects and, and putting some numerical processes around some of those financial um, and mental health data, and what is really the impact across the wider employment and some of the barriers that are included. So, um, you know, that, that's where we got up to, and, and I'll hand over now to the team to, to talk about some of those findings. Thanks very much, Ari, um, for giving us uh, that background now. So you've you've had a bit of an overview of the rationale for the work. And so we'll talk, uh, you talk a bit now in terms of, of what we found through the, the research. So as I mentioned earlier, we started with some qualitative work. We did focus groups with um, current disability employment service participants who had experience working part-time um, and consultants who, who supported people in those processes. We did them online due to COVID restrictions, but managed to get people from um, all across the, the country um, with different ages and genders and, and people who have um, different uh, impairment types. And if you're interested in this, you can read about the findings in a bit more uh, detail in the report, but I wanted to just highlight a, a few things. So the DES participants that we spoke to told us that they really valued um, part-time work. And, and so one participant told us, part-time work helps with self-esteem, self-worth, identity, 
knowing I'm using my time productively, having motivation every day, having a routine helps you get motivated for other things, which means other little goals can feel more achievable. It makes you want to be more organized with your time, make time for cooking, shopping, bills and medical appointments. And these thoughts are really echoed by a number of other people that we spoke to. He said, look, there's some real value um, in part time work and it has some really significant impacts on on our lives and 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 how we're able to um to to work in that way um as already said before some des participants did tell us that you know part-time work was the the kind of li limit of their capacity so given that they're balancing families you know appointment support needs um that actually it wasn't possible um, for them to work full time. Um, and there's a quote here from one of the people we spoke to who said, I'm recovering from cancer and I'm hoping I'll get my energy and stamina back, but it's really hard after having time off work and then coming back. I'm just coping with part time and I wouldn't cope with full time work. So for some people, part time work is really valuable because that's, you know, that's the, the limit of um, how they're going to work in terms of, and, and it can add real meaning uh, in terms of, of their lives. But for other people, they told us that part time work can be really helpful as a route into full time work. So starting work or returning to work can be a really challenging thing to do on a, on a full time basis. If it's your first entry into the workforce or you've been out of work for a while because of an acquired disability, it can be really difficult to go straight back into um, full time work. So starting part-time work can be a really good way to help um, gain your stamina and, and to start to balance home and, and work life. For others, what they said is, well, I'm exploring a new career route, and this can be a really good way to test that out through um, part-time work. So a few people told us that, you know, part-time work can be a really good springboard into other, un, into other work. It can be easy to fear the next thing uh, because you've got something and you don't want to let it go. And, and so what this person and others told it is part-time work can be a really good way into full-time work, but it doesn't always mean that that transition process is easy um, and it needs some good support to make sure that it's realized in a, in a full way. But at the moment, there are some challenges in the system that, that mean that it's not easy to do that. So for example, if you're um, a voluntary a disability employment service participant, um, then you might be uh, subject to mutual obligations. So even if you've managed to gain uh, part-time work, so in effect, you're working part-time, managing home life, sometimes studying, and you're still required to demonstrate that you're applying for, for full-time work. And so that can be um, a really stressful process. And I guess for us, if individuals experience significant stress at that point, then it might impede any potential uh, transition into uh, full-time work over time. Now, another really important point that came from the qualitative research is that job matching is really important. So not just any job is going to help you build stamina um, and balance. It needs to be really well matched to your skills, your abilities and, and your interests. And this is really nicely uh, illustrated in a quote from one DES participant who said that my mental health improves with part time work provided it's the right sort of fit for me. So not just any job is going to help individuals um, get into and, and sustain work. And so we need to do some careful work to make sure that match is, is done well and it's, it's a good fit. And we'll hear from Bella later and she might tell us a bit more about some of that from her experience. Um, making that good fit can sometimes require some really creative thinking. Um, and one DES consultant uh, we spoke to told us how they'd uh, done that. So they said, I had a client with lots of nursing experience, but also lots of trauma um, and she couldn't go back into it. I had to try and think about how to get her work that was related to her skills. She has an impressive resume. And so she went into the beauty field and she got so excited and wanted to study it had never crossed her mind that she might be able to use her knowledge and skills. And so in this case, the consultant thought really carefully about the skills that this person had and how that they could use it in a different industry. Um, and in this case, she went on and, and built up those working hours um, over time. 
So it's a bit of a snapshot through our qualitative um, results and what we found out through the focus groups. And as I said, what we then wanted to do is say, well, can we see these sorts of patterns that people had told us about reflected in some other data sets? And can we quantify some of this? So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Zoe Aitken, um, who will tell us a bit about the work that she led exploring mental health impacts. Thanks, Helen. Um, I'll first introduce myself briefly. Uh, I'm an epidemiologist and I work as a senior research fellow in the Disability and Health Unit at the University of Melbourne. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that I'm joining you from today, the lands of the Yeagle people, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So the quantitative analysis was conducted in two parts, uh, and I'm going to talk through some of the results for, from the first part. Uh, and this addresses the second and third research questions that Helen mentioned previously and are listed on this slide. Um, so this research was looking at the benefits of part-time employment to DES participants and benefits to carers and family members of DES participants. Um, so it focuses, the result of the, the work that we were leading focuses on, on the impact of part-time employment on self-reported mental health. And I, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of Lu Ye, uh, a fantastic master's student, student who worked with me to conduct this work. Um, so in this, in this part of the work, we use data from the HILDA survey, um, the Household Income and Labour Dynamics in Australia survey. HILDA is a large nationally representative study. It collects information from uh, a large group of individuals and the same group of individuals every year um, and has been doing so since 2001. Now, the benefit of a longitudinal design, like a study such as HILDA, is that we can look at what happens to a person's mental health when uh, different aspects of their lives change. So when their employment status changes, we can look at what happens to their mental health. And that helps us to gain an understanding of how part-time work impacts on people's mental health. We use data from five years of the HILDA survey from 2015 to 2019 and restricted our sample to the working age population, people aged between 15 and 64 years. Uh, and we restricted it to people who were in the labor force. So we excluded people who were not working and not looking for employment. So those defined as being out of the labor force, not in the labor force. In HILDA, we could not just look at, at the experiences of DES participants, but we could identify a group of people with disability. So defined, and we, we identified that group as people who, who reported having a disability in um, three or more of the five waves of data that we use for this study. And we compared them to people without disability who were people who reported disability in one or less waves out of those five waves. In HILDA, we could also identify household members, so family members of people with disability and their informal carers. To understand the impact of working part time or full time compared to not working, we examined four categories of working hours. So we looked at people who were working zero hours, so people who are unemployed. We had two categories of part time work, so people who were working one to 14 hours per week and people who were working 15 to 29 hours per week. And then we also looked at people who were working full time, which we define as people working 30 or more hours per week. So we looked at transitions in employment status and looked at how those transitions were associated with changes in people's mental health using a commonly used mental health questionnaire, the SF36, which includes five questions relating to people's mental health, and it's combined to produce an overall mental health score. And a higher score represents better mental health. So here on this first slide of results, you can see the results for people with disability. And those coefficients in the table, what they're showing us is they're showing us estimated mean differences in people's mental health score associated with transitions between categories of working hours compared to being unemployed. So if we look at that column on the right, which shows the results for people with disability, we found that on average transitions from unemployment to working one to 14 hours per week were associated with increases in mental health scores of 2.6 points on the mental health scale. 
for people who went from being unemployed to working part-time, working 15 to 29 hours per week, their mental health score increased on average by 4.5 points. And a transition to full-time employment was associated with an increase of six points on the mental health scale. So what does a difference of four or six points mean? Well, a difference um, on this mental health scale, a difference of four points is thought to represent an important difference in mental health in clinical terms. So we can interpret these findings as evidence of large, clinically meaningful differences in mental health associated with working part-time and working full-time. Um, so in some, increased working hours was associated with beneficial effects um, to the mental health of people with disability. Now, in the next slide, um, we're looking at the results for people without disability. Uh, so when we look at those same results, we see much smaller beneficial effects of work, work on mental health um, across the three categories of working hours compared to being unemployed. So we see smaller increases of about one point on the mental health scale associated with working part-time and full-time compared to being unemployed. So much, we're seeing evidence of much larger effects of employment on mental health for people with disability. I'm also going to talk through some other results that aren't presented here, we, uh, but, but are detailed um, in the report. So if you're interested, uh, please go and have a look at those results. But we also looked at whether there was a difference for different subgroups of people with disability. We looked at whether there are differences uh, by age group, gender, education, country of birth and remoteness. And what we found was that the beneficial effects of part-time and full-time employment on mental health were, were greater for younger people. So younger people with disability aged 15 to 44 years, we saw uh, larger beneficial effects and much smaller effects for older people uh, aged 45 to 64 years. Um, we found greater beneficial effects for women, for people born in Australia compared to those born overseas. Uh, we found greater effects for people with low education compared to high education and larger effects for people living in metropolitan areas compared to regional and remote areas. So we found some important differences for subgroups of people with disability. Uh, we also looked at the effects for family members and informal carers of people with disability. Um, so again, these results present estimated mean differences in, the, in mental health scores, but these are the mental health scores of family members and carers, which are associated with the working hours of people with disability who are in their household. So we've, the results suggest um, that there are some, there may be large increase, increases in mental health scores for carers um, of people with disability when those people with disability are working 15 to 29 hours or working full time compared to being unemployed. We see differences of six to seven points on the mental health scale. However, it's really important to note here that we have a small sample. Um, we can identify only a small sample of informal carers within the HILDA data. So there's a lot of uncertainty um, in these estimates, but it does provide some suggestion that they may be an important impact um, for carers of people with disability. When we look at family members, so the, the left column here, uh, we find no evidence of an effect on mental health associated with changing in working hours um, in our study. So the next slide um, just summarizes our key findings. So we found large beneficial effects of part-time work for the self-reported mental health of people with disability consistent with the findings uh, of the qualitative research that Helen was describing previously, which emphasized the value uh, of part-time work for people with disability. We found that the impact of work, both part-time and full-time on mental health was large um, and more beneficial for people with disability compared to people without disability. And this analysis provided some suggestion of a beneficial impact of increased working hours on the mental health of informal carers of people with disability. I'm now going to pass on to Dennis to talk about the findings of the second part of the quantitative data analysis. Thanks so much, Zoe. Um, so I'll just introduce myself. Uh, I'm Professor Dennis Petrie. I'm based at the Centre for Health Economics at Monash University. Um, I'd like to acknowledge 
the work of Corinna Saxby, who's uh, done a lot of this work. Um, so building on what Zoe said, we see changes in mental health um, as people um, change their work status and number of work hours that they do. So we see improvements in mental health um, for working more hours. And so really, we wanted to kind of extend on that and think about how those changes uh, in work hours and mental health associated with it might also flow on in terms of changes in mental health care use. And so, you know, really we wanted to think about um, how much healthcare savings there might be from moving people from not working to working part or full time. So what we did, so again, this was kind of a quantitative analysis. So we looked at um, data from the multi-agency data integration project. And so this is new data that the Australian government has um, made available where they link data from different uh, agencies. And so you know, one of the benefits of this data is that we can then look at the impacts um, across government rather than siloed um, in particular departments. And so what we did with this data, uh, it's got the 2011 census, and we kind of focused in on those people who reported a core activity limitation in that census. And so then we uh, looked at the domino data, which is um, data for those people that are on disability support payments uh, or new start. And we looked at those people who are ever on payments um, between 2011 and 2019. Um, and that was about uh, 200,000 people. And so from the domino data, we then looked at the people's reported hours of working while they were on payments. And we then linked that for those individuals to their Medicare records, um, to their use of out-of-hospital out of um, medical services. So that's GP use, um, psychologists, uh, psychiatrist use, and also the scripts that they filled, so prescription medicines. And so uh, we, we took that data and then we wanted to consider what the outcomes might be from working on total MBS or Medicare um, service use and mental health scripts. And so we wanted to look at both use and also in terms of the benefit in terms of the amount of government support that gets provided to these providers um, to kind of deliver these services and, uh, and medicines. And so how we did that, uh, we looked at changes within the individual over time in their hours worked or reported hours worked and their healthcare use in the next quarter. And so we wanted to look at whether or not people changing from not working to working part-time or full-time was associated with changes in their use of healthcare in the following quarter. And so this fix, fixed effects model, what we want to try and do is control for aspects that were constant within the person. So we want to look at changes within the same person over time, rather than looking at changes across people. Um, and so the main reason for this is to try and make sure that we're not kind of confounding it with other differences across individuals. Uh, next slide, thanks. Okay, so these are our results. Um, and so we've got um, the, the impacts on mental health services used and the impact on mental health scripts used. And so we kind of use the comparison group of those people who are not working or unemployed, working zero hours per week. And we compared it how um, services changed and how scripts changed when people changed to working between one to 14 hours per week, 15 to 29 hours per week, or 30 or more hours per week. And so if we focus on uh, services to start with, um, if we go from being not working to working one to 14 hours per week, then we see a reduction in the use of our services um, and by about 0 0.02 per quarter. And in terms of what this means, if we think about how much um, services usually get used, then this represents a 6.1% reduction in the use of services. Now, if we step that up a bit and someone's now working 15 to 29 hours per week, then we see that that further reduces and it reduces by about 15.7% in terms of what they were using um, the reference group there. And then again, if we step that up to 30 or more hours per week, we actually don't see too much change in service use. We only see a reduction um, compared to not working of 16.6%. Now that's for services. If we think about the scripts that are being filled, uh, we see a similar um, reductions may be slightly smaller for the scripts um, from going to not working to working one to 14 hours per week. We see a 3.7% reduction in the number of mental health scripts that are filled by individuals. 
Um, for those working 15 to 29 hours compared to not working, we see a 7.1% reduction. Uh, and for those working 30 or more hours per week, we see a 9% reduction compared to not working. Now, you know, so overall, we kind of see these reductions in um, mental health care that's being used. Um, and we see pretty similar reductions for those who are working between 15 to 29 hours or 30 or more hours. Next slide, thanks. Now, if we break that down to what exactly uh, is being used or re reduced as a result, um, we've got mental health related items that are delivered by the GP. Uh, we've got psychiatry services, uh, we've got psychologist services, and we've got allied health services. And so this just gives us the reduction compared to not working across these different categories. And we see that in, uh, in particular, we see that the majority of the reduction uh, is due to reduction in psychological services that are being used. But we also see reduction in psychiatry services, uh, not so much a reduction in allied health services, um, but then also a reduction in mental health services that are delivered by a GP. So compared to not working, working any hours was associated with less mental health care use, though we see similar effects um, for those 15 to 29 or 30 or more. Next slide, thanks. Okay, so really we wanna try and take that kind of reduction in use and think about, well, what does that mean in dollar terms? So if we wanna try and quantify that to think about, well, how much money would we save in terms of reduction in healthcare use? Um, so we, what we did is we applied those results to the current caseload of DES participants and those people with disability on job active. And so we estimated that if we moved all of them from not working to working part-time hours, uh, 14 to 29 hours per week, and we estimated that there would be a, a $62 million per year savings in terms of healthcare services. And in particular, that savings would be focused on the reduction in mental health services and mental health prescriptions. So we see quite a large reduction in mental health costs uh, associated with moving people from not working to working part-time hours. Thanks. Thanks very much, Dennis and, and Zoe. So now I'm gonna move on and, and have a think about what those, what those findings taken together um, all, all mean. And we believe that, that part-time work seems to have a positive impact on a number um, of areas of, of well-being. Um, for some people, part-time work is a useful gateway into, into full-time work, but for others um, who, who may not go into full-time work, part-time part work is still incredibly value, valuable and can have a range of um, positive impacts. Um, we found in our research that, that people who are unemployed have lower well-being and that well-being improves as, as people work although we didn't find any difference in terms of full and, and part-time work for people with disability. Um, although we did find some evidence that casual jobs produce a smaller um, increase in, in well-being than, than more um, sustained roles. Um, we also found that all categories of working hours are associated with large beneficial mental health effects compared to being unemployed. And that the benefits for people with disability are more significant um, than they are for the for the broader population. Um, so what we found in the qualitative um, work about reported mental health benefits is supported there through the survey data that, that Zoe spoke to us about. And when we look at the administrative data that, that Dennis talked about, we found that as people work, we see reduced costs associated with healthcare services, mental health services and mental health scripts. Um, in this project, we only focused, as, as Ari mentioned before, on, on healthcare costs. Um, but we could imagine that um, if we did some more work and we looked at a broader range of government services, we might find other kind of benefits of, of part-time work that appear there and reduce costs across other um, service settings. But it seems quite clear to us that part-time work can have beneficial um, impacts that go just beyond kind of taxable um, income um, and hold the potential to produce impacts across other areas of government. But there are some policy and practice implications. There's some barriers within the current system that, that don't always make this a, an easy um, process. Um, again, these are detailed more in the, the full report, um, um, but I'll just speak to a few of these um, now. 
So as, as we already mentioned, the way that mutual obligations uh, currently operate do pose a bit of a challenge for people pursuing uh, part-time work as a vehicle into full-time work. So um, removing these could, could lead to an easier transition um, for some people. Um, and as we also talked about job matching and making sure that people have a quality job um, is really is really important and that needs supporting well. So not just any job is going to help people retain their confidence and, and stamina um, and a bad match in terms of jobs we think could have a, a detrimental impact around uh, mental health and, and well-being. Uh, I think it's pretty well documented that there are some challenges in terms of how the disability support pension um, operates um, as if people want to kind of gradually um, increase their their working hours and the boundaries around that um, uh, mean that that can can pose some issues for people as as they move through that that process so there's potential to think about those kind of boundaries in different ways or think about use of things like tax credits to make sure that we don't have uh, perverse incentives that are, that are caused by the rules around um, that system. In, in terms of what this means for DES services in the qualitative work, particularly what, what I think is really clear is that the first month is really important in terms of supporting people to get into work um, and then to be able to sustain that over the first month. That can often be a really stressful time as people get into new routines. Um, but the first six months um, uh, are also pretty important in terms of getting people settled into roles. So working with individuals and with employers to make sure the right sorts of um, supports and accommodations are in place. After about the six month period, it seems that people generally get pretty well settled in those roles and then start to think if they're um, if they're going to take on more hours, that's a point at which they start to, to consider that. Um, there does need to be some more work done to kind of really understand those transition pathways in a better sort of way and think about what sort of jobs and what sort uh, are, are most suitable and what sort of um, supports need to be in place to support people if they um, want to get into part time work. And then if they do want to kind of increase those hours uh, and transition, what will that what will that look like? Um, and you can read all the suggestions about um, what we think needs to happen uh, in terms of the system and what some of the limitations um, uh, of our research are and where we might do some future work around that. Um, so that's our, our research. But before we wanted, before we finished up today, we also wanted to, to hear from somebody who's got experience of, of, of working part time as a uh, as a person with disability. I'm really, really happy that we've got Bella with us here today. Uh, Bella's joining us from <clears throat> Rockhampton. How are you doing, Bella? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Good. Uh, maybe you can start, Bella, by telling us a little bit about you. Um, yeah, so my name's Bella. I'm, uh, I'm in... Uh, a part-time position and um yeah sorry my uh, name's Bella I'm 20 21 years old and um I live in Queensland and yeah I just love working because it's um easy and it gives me something to do every day but yeah. Right, Bella. And you you actually have more than one part-time job, don't yeah. you? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. do you want I, to tell us a bit about them? Yeah, so I started with Mountain Uni when I was 17 and I've done that ever since. Um and then I've um moved to Queensland. Um got a job at Bunnings um and yeah that's where I am now and I've been doing that for a, a year now I think yeah right and so you've got those two two jobs the one up there in Queensland at Bunnings and then the other bit is Bella uh contributes to a research project that's led out of the University of Melbourne looking at youth yeah. and youth employment and you chair some of those yeah. um, committees of those young folk there 
right yeah and why is it that you wanted um to to work Bella tell us a bit about that um I wanted to work because um I felt like when I was wasn't working um I was just sitting at home doing nothing and that wasn't my intention I wanted to earn a living um um support myself and just to get up and do something every day is um I love structure so just to get up and do something every day would be like a structure to my day almost yeah it gives you a bit of a routine yeah a routine to do something yeah and, uh, and what about um what about the people that you meet at work is that um, possible? yeah I love I get all different kinds of people at work so I love being interactive with um customers and yeah so that's right and tell us a bit about how did you get your job um I went through a uh, indigenous um indigenous employment service um and i i'm like i want a job so um they said yep yeah, come meet me and i'll get you signed up for an introduction and then um they helped me with ev like everything and then yeah so that's great and and do you get much training in your role do you develop yeah, yeah. heaps um the training's all going yeah yeah um, and what makes a good employer for you what what people what do people need to do um, just be understanding that I can't work um, certain hours and there's some boundaries that I, there's some, um, not boundaries, what, there's some limitations I have so I can't, um, so just be understanding of my person and yeah does that make sense I'm... that makes sense Bella yeah um you and I chatted the other day and one of the things you were saying you liked about your employer at the moment is you feel that they've got your back yeah yeah they got my back and yeah yeah um and that hasn't always been the case you had a part-time job before that wasn't quite as good as this was it yeah um I felt like they didn't um used me to my potential I was only working um um under 10 hours a week and I was like I need more hours so um so I just resigned and yeah now that I'm happy I in the position and the hours that I do yeah. And at is so you got better hours and they use your skills a bit better yeah. yeah 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 and could you tell me your thoughts Bella about what makes a good uh disability employment service what do they need to do well, I think to make a good disability employment service they would need to interact with the um client more and being more based around the client's needs and because not everyone's the same like we have different needs and we need to um make sure that we do that uh, we have I don't I don't know how to say this so forgive me if I um we need to we need to um be open i don't we need to do 
have more say in what we can do because we can do a lot. It's just that some places won't or some wouldn't be a fit for us. They would be a fit for other people, but not certain people that need certain things. I don't know. Tell me if I'm saying, I don't know. No, yeah. And what you were telling me yeah, uh, the other day, Bella, was about one of the things that you, in your other part-time job in Melbourne Uni, is you, you know, learn everybody's. Yeah, everyone. Yeah, everyone's different. Everyone can learn at a different pace. Everyone, so it just needs to be the right fit for you, and um, make sure you're comfortable with the job that. And you, they, you need to be comfortable enough to say without um, concern to say, um, hey, look, I don't feel comfortable in this job. Can I please have another one? Without, um, can I please look at another possible fit for me um, without them turning around and telling the employer that it needs to be more, com like not more confidential, but like safe to say mm -hmm. that kind of stuff without you worrying yeah. about that. So, One of the other things you were saying to me the other day as well, Bella, was about, you know, uh, you you know being disabled is not the thing that defines you is yeah. it? there's lots of interesting yeah. things about you yeah and being disabled is a part of me it's not all of me so I would like people to see me as me and not just a disability so and do you think through you know through your job that you have now that you change people's perspectives on people? Yes, certainly. Because um, my boss said um to me the other day, um, you work harder than um, and I find this in almost anyone that has a disability. Um, they feel I'm not talking. To from anyone uh, I'm just talking from my own experience and um the things that I saw on like tv and stuff um because Dylan Alcott actually said um there's more people willing with a disability to go further than people because we need to um prove ourselves more Mm -hmm. I think that's the point that, um, well, I'm trying, like, if I want a job that I, I'm really I'm passionate about, like, I would love to prove myself worthy of that job and not just have that job, just to have that job. So does that make sense? That makes sense to me, Bella. Thanks for yeah. that. Is there anything else you want to tell us um, um given what you've heard today um no I think that I've covered all that I want yeah okay yeah, thank you Bella and it was really great to hear and a lot of your experiences seem yeah. to show similar things to, to to what we found in the research but particularly with that job matching issue um and i yeah. think that's so important so thank you very much for sharing that with us today no worries. All good. thanks bella um so we're nearing the end of our time here today so i just want to wrap up and, and thank all of our um presenters today and um to bella and to dennis and to zoe and to ari and to wise employment for supporting um the research the link to the full report is in the chat. We'll also send that out to everybody who signed up uh, today. If you've got any questions about that or you want to get any more detail on what we've talked about today, then feel free to get in touch. That's my email address on um, 
on the final slide there and I'm really happy for you to get in touch and can direct any queries that you might have um, but once again thank you everybody for coming along today and uh, enjoy the rest of your day thank you <laughs>